The week after the Navy's parachute team drops in in Reeser Stadium, Oregon State tries to get its Pac-12 season to take flight at Utah this weekend. What do the Beavers need to do to have a chance at a win? Hashtag Beavers football starts right now. Coming up on Halloween, and it is a pack night. We have the Timbers with their playoff opener. We have the Ducks football. We have NFL football on. Better make sure you Uber if you're coming down here, though. Oh, <laughs> my no goodness. No parking. There is no parking. You'd be like Slade. He just parked on the sidewalk. It's fine. <laughs> they got a spot reserved for me. It's VIP. Yeah, it's true. Well, we are glad you're with us. I'm Katie Brown along with Slade Norris and Nigel Burton. Of course, they don't need an introduction. And... We are glad that you are joining us to talk about Beavers because who cares about the rest of the sports going on, right? We got, we got a Pac-12 season to get on track. And, well, going to Utah, no small assignment. The teams played a great game last year, and the Beavers are going to have to really bring it. And so we will talk a lot about the Utes. But looking at Colorado, some interesting things happening for the Beavers, starting with quarterback. More than Seth Collins in the game. And, uh, well, we'll take a look at the game first, and you see the rushing yards. Just over 200 yards, there was another aspect there. We had a, a young Portland boy who sort of uh, announced his arrival in that game in the rushing department. Third down, six for 15 and uh, for the Beavers, and they just had a chance. It was down to the wire there, had a chance at the end, and just couldn't score to, to take that game. Kind of frustrating uh, at this point. What did we learn out of that? The offense needs to get going. How do we do that? Well, probably the most important stat that wasn't really in that stat line was 13 of 32. That was a combined completion rate, completion percentage, completion fraction, I guess, <laughs> of, of the quarterbacks combined in Nick Mitchell and Seth Collins, which 13 of, when you go 13 of 32 for 199 yards, no touchdowns and a pick, that's not enough to win in the Pac-12. And there's an old saying that basically says, if you have two quarterbacks, you really have none. When you've got three quarterbacks, I don't know, does that make it minus one? Like, I'm not sure what that is, but... I, we knew there were issues when we watched in fall camp. I visited with the Pac-12 network. Gary Anderson and his staff knew they had their hands, you know, their, they had their work cut out for them uh, in terms of trying to develop these guys as quickly as they could to win now. And and uh, it was tough sledding versus uh, a defense that doesn't even come in, in the hemisphere of Utah's that they're going to face this week. When Nick did come in, though, I mean, he had some good deep balls. He made some good throws. It's the intermediate stuff, the timing stuff that he really needed to work on. And how can you do that when you haven't practiced? I mean, you're the third team quarterback before last week, so you're getting, what, one rep a period, maybe, if you're lucky? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think, and I get it, and they wanted to pump up, you know, Mr. Mitchell and everything. I think he got a little exposed as the game wore on there at the end. I mean, on that last drive, he was overthrowing guys. He was underthrowing guys. I mean, that's what we saw. Uh, in fall camp was just inaccuracy of really the whole group. Uh, and so, yeah, like I said, I mean, there's there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, I would expect to see a lot simpler things, you know, moving forward to just try to give these guys a little bit of confidence to finish the season. Well, I'd, I'd obviously like a, very different, a very different, a very different-looking team when you have one guy on versus the other one. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. So when you have a Utah team, and we'll skip ahead a little bit, but that has such a good defense, and you have Collins who really relies on his legs, do you go to Mitchell more then in a game like that, or do you go with what you've had most of the season? I said last week, go to Mitchell. I mean, why not? We're, we're not we, we've done Seth all year long. We know he's not going to be able to run against them. He uh, hasn't had success throwing the ball. I, I would say this. The problem is Nick Mitchell can't throw to himself. And right now, <laughs> the wide receivers are doing absolutely nothing to help the quarterbacks. I mean, my guess is Brent Brennan is sitting somewhere in his office either pulling his hair out or, br or, or praying because, I mean, you look at Victor Bolden drops two critical passes. Uh, Guy I mean, has two offensive passes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really become one of those things. That, and you always, we would always tell our veteran guys, your job is to help the younger guys develop. And right now, their group really isn't stepping up to do anything to help those guys. I mean, Nick Mitchell did have a couple nice little passes. Right before the half. They then got dropped. And it yeah. was, it's like, come on, man. I mean, the guy is just, I mean, when you're that young, you're just trying to hang on to anything. And, uh, and when the guys that you're counting on don't come through in the clutch for you. So if it's me, what I would do is a lot of really kind of old Mike Riley offense, if we're going to pass, a lot of stacked uh, wide receivers, bunch, things that, try to keep the Utah DBs that are probably the best secondary in the conference right now from getting their hands on our receivers. Uh, and then, really, I actually think you go more to Seth because the one thing about their system is it's not always great to deal with the read option. 
When you're going man, you're putting yourself in a lot of one-on-one -on -one tackle situations, and he's really your biggest threat in terms of an explosive play on the entire field. Well, one thing seems certain, we will be seeing both of them moving forward, at least in the foreseeable future. And this week, offensive coordinator Dave Baldwin talked about the quarterback situation. With Seth in the game, and Seth's our starter, don't, don't get that wrong. They put a nine-man package in the box, much like Air Force option and the whole deal. And we wanted them to say, well, wait a second, we can't do that. And that's why we brought in the other. And Ryan Nall had holes that we haven't had to run the football. And you'd like your running back to be your lead runner, not the quarterback. We want Seth to rush the ball and have big plays, but he shouldn't be the leader, and that's what happened. So that was the good thing about it. In terms of reads and, and all of that, Dave, how did Nick in his first collegiate game hold up and execute the offense? I, th I thought he did a nice job with his reads and everything. We weren't as accurate again. Uh, that's been a problem with who's ever been in there. We had some what I call layups, uh, especially late in the fourth quarter. We had a fade to number 13, and uh, I made the statement to them, never in the history of the NCAA, and C2A has a ball ever been completed out of bounds. So we got to throw it in bounds in that situation, especially on a fourth down. So that will happen. You know, it's it's part of that, that ex execution, but I was really pleased with his progress. How has Seth just taken everything? Obviously, it's been kind of a roller coaster of the last few weeks, whether it's his performance, whether it's the situation, just how has he handled things? See, I sort of like it. I sort of like that, you know, all of a sudden he was the guy and all these things, and, you know, it, you got to earn everything you do in life, and sometimes there's setbacks, and how do you act to the adversity? And I think he has come out and really acted well this week. He's really put it on his shoulders. I'm the guy. I'm going to take it. And, you know, nothing's easy. Nothing's easy in life. And all of a sudden, he had to step back and see what it is, and now he's working his butt off to be the guy. And he is our starter. But I like the adversity and, you know, having the kids challenged. And McKenzie tweets in, already loving the Nick Mitchell-Seth Collins combo, hashtag go Beav. So the one wrinkle in the whole situation is that Seth Collins did miss practice today, actually started warming up, apparently aggravated an injury, and no word yet on whether he will be ready for Utah. But uh, certainly if he can go, he will, because the Beavers will need his weapons. All right, still to come, just getting started on talking about the youths, why they will be especially motivated this weekend. And coming up next, the freshman from Portland who now has the best nicknames on the team. The statement he made in the game last weekend still ahead. It is time now for Burton's Breakdown, brought to you by Standard TV and Appliance. Setting the standard since 1947, and it is time to go to the Mondo Pad with Nigel. It's collaboration that works, and Nigel, what are you sharing tonight? Well, Katie, we're going to talk about really one of my favorite guys on the Beavs. He's the utility guy for the Oregon State Beavers offense right now. I'm talking about Ryan Nall. I had the pleasure of coaching his brother at Oregon State, know the family really well, and every bit of success that he's getting right now is really awesome to watch. Central Catholic Zone. Let's go to the In Focus Mondo Pack collaboration at Works and see our own Ryan Nall breakdown. Now, early on in the game against Colorado, the thing that I wanted to show, and people are asking, is why is Ryan playing so much <laughs> <laughs> of course, right? It really does. It is collab collaboration that works. But the thing that we wanted to talk about basically was show why Ryan Nall is playing so much. The biggest reason you're getting a lot of play out of him is by the fact of really, as much as it, is, as it is his power running, it's really his blocking. One of the very first plays in the first series that Oregon State had against Colorado, he was a lead blocker in a huge run that went for Seth Collins. Later on, when he scored that touchdown, actually had three guys show up at the point of attack. And because of his size, the DB actually decided to go low. He's able to use his athleticism, get skinny, and score. Those are the things that he brings to the table that really Chris Brown or Storm Woods is not going to really intimidate anybody on the goal line. But when you take a 255-pound Ryan Nall, that's something that a lot of those guys don't want to see at the line of scrimmage. So continue to see that, to see him develop will be awesome, and especially I'm looking forward to him next year. Hopefully he loses a little bit of weight, gets a little bit more agile. I think he'll be a great addition to the Beavers' offense. 122 yards rushing, including 82 in the second half. He certainly did steal the show on offense against Colorado. And this week, Ryan Nall talked about his performance. 
You know, obviously the blocking is there. It, they, they do such a good job. Uh, the O-linemen with their blocks, they work their butts off every every play. And, you know, the, the next part is me just trying to get past get past the blocks and, and fight for a first down or fight for, for the touchdown, you know, whatever it may be. It's personally, I just got to, you know, work hard and drive my feet, be able to, to get that extra yardage. In high school, my senior year, I think I only had like one game that was over 20 carries. So I definitely not used to getting the ball that much, but uh, you know I was sore after the game. But you know, as it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, I can't really complain about it because we got to focus on the next week, focus on the ne the next opponent. Yeah, I definitely felt uh, like I was I was getting into a rhythm. Uh, I felt like I, I was I was feeling it. I was feeling the holes, reading the reading the defense pretty well. I was being able to uh, to bust it open to the secondary. But unfortunately, I didn't I didn't get to bust the 80 yarder or, or the the 50 yarder for <laughs> for you guys. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> we hear you do. Yeah, I like to think so. <laughs> And love this. Tweets all about Ryan Nall, but this is hashtag Recky Nall. I don't know if he's a Miley Cyrus fan, but there we go. He came oh God, in like Recky Nall. <laughs> does have clothes. That, is, <laughs> that is a great nickname, but I'm hoping he does not have Miley Cyrus in his trunk right now. That is a really good nickname. But, you know, the Beavers have needed somebody to sort of provide this spark to do something for them, play with the kind of there's passion. There's the play you were talking about right there, Coach. I mean, there's three, yeah, three guys show up at the point of attack. And, and I mean, they play it. They play it perfectly. But because of his size, his strength, and to be honest, the thing that's scary about him is he is a, he can run. I mean, he is fast. I mean, we talked. We we were the first ones to offer him, of course. I think I offered him when he was in a freshman. <laughs> <laughs> we had Jake, and we're like, you know what? I don't think Jake's the best player in the family. <laughs> so, uh, and, and he's an even better kid. It, it's really it's really awesome to watch. Really enjoying seeing Ryan Nall on the field. Big boy has speed. One tweet, another one from Warner. Can't believe it's not Nall, followed by Nall, then Nall in the backfield. <laughs> They're saving it for the Civil War. Warner rides Matt Severson 2.0. Oh, I'm actually Matt thinking that's Severson a compliment from Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Matt's like, Geez, that would, hey, the, you know. The I'm, next Mr. Oregon, I guess. Yeah, well. Uh, <laughs> well, what, well, Gary Anderson, you know, when he came to the podium or came into the post game room, didn't really want to talk a whole lot after a game like Colorado, but somebody brings up Ryan Nall and he's calling him more daddy, and I want 30 more of him, and uh, clearly he's more daddy. Coach. You know, truly, I mean, he's the kind of guy, I mean, you look at a guy who is, one, he's from the state of Oregon, he's a smart kid, comes from a great family, he's six foot three, he's 255 pounds, and he can run. I, I, I'll take 11 of them, too. <laughs> I mean, that is the kind of guy, he's athletic, he can, he's got hands to catch the football, out of the backfield, he runs with power. He's got speed. You could line him up on defense; he'll stick you. He's able to, you know, he has the length and the strength to get off a of block. So, he's the kind of guy that he has the ability to do so many things. Those are the kind of kids you want to recruit, and you can really build a program with a lot of guys like that. And what's great right now, we were kind of laughing about earlier. You were saying, you know, he might not even have a complete understanding of the whole offense. Oh no, I mean, no, that's a nice running. way of putting. It. Ryan has no <laughs> idea what he's doing right now. I wasn't gonna say that. No, he doesn't. He's like, he's he's like a big kid who. He's just playing around with people thinking like, oh, this is fun. And he's killing people. But yeah, he's just doing it on his pure athletic yeah, yeah. body. You don't right know what he's doing. Imagine if he actually <laughs> does develop and know the offense. Ryan, know listen, doing Ryan, stop blocking like this. Okay? <laughs> that stopped working in peewees. For you, it kind of works. But if you start using your hands, Worked he's going to start that first series. people. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> SC, it's not going to work versus SC. So, but, uh, I mean, it's it's so fun to watch. I'm yelling at the screen like, yes, you know. So he, he, he I am, a, I've been a huge fan of him since he was itty bitty. <laughs> so if we got him, if we got Storm back next week, everybody back full. Do, do we? Who gets to start? Do we start Ryan? You know, you're talking about say, say this game. This is a game that is built for Ryan Nall. It's really not built for Stormwoods. This is a bloody knuckles. You know, we're not going to try to trick you with some stuff. We're going to just run and pound you in the face. He's the one guy they have in that backfield and can say, you know what? I'm not taking any shots. I'm delivering them. And uh, I think it would be a, a, a great game plan to just keep feeding the rock. All right, we shall see you. Coming up next on the show, no shortage of connections between the sidelines of Utah and Oregon State. Boy, it's a long list. We'll talk about that coming up next. Yes, Slade, you do look good, don't you? <laughs> thank you so much, Kyle, for that. Thank you. <laughs> Kyle, our producer, thank you. And the orange pants, I mean, you really got it going on. I do have a, a backside there, you know? 
some squats. <laughs> Nigel is speechless at this point. <laughs> <laughs> is it speechless or just jealousy? I mean, uh, I don't know. I actually think I threw up in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Got a small up. Can someone please, anybody, um, Slade, I, I'm, at, I'm speaking to anybody who loves Slade North. <laughs> Please tell him to stop buying clothes in the children's section. <laughs> Baby cap. <Okay. laughs> Nobody needs to wear Oshkosh be gosh beaver gear. It, does, it doesn't need to be that tight. Hey, I do it for the world, man. My God. Just try to make the world a better place you're, one you're, butt cheek at a time. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> line. Okay. What is going on? All right. Well... Interesting point of the game at Utah this weekend is the sidelines. Oregon State with eight coaches that have connections to Utah. And well, when you take a look at everything, they look at Kalani Sataki. Well, he was a defensive coordinator. He, he just came over. A lot of the guys there he brought over into Utah. The defense are going to face but Gary Anderson. I mean, this list is there's just and he still talks to Kyle Whittingham all the time. I mean, this is a close, close, close group between these two schools. Coach, I wanted to ask you, because, I mean, you have gone coach at different schools, and I know just for me watching the Nebraska games, I can go through and see Coach Banker on the sidelines, and I know his signals, and so <laughs> I can go through and watch the game and know what he's calling and everything, and I can even see some of Kalani's and just know, because some calls are generic, you know, but uh, is that a benefit to you? I mean, not even just maybe signals or, or just scheme or knowing the players, you know, how much does it affect the game? Anything. I mean, anything that you can get is an advantage. I mean, I've seen over 15 years of coaching, I think I've seen it all. I've seen everything from, you know, coaches stealing signals from other coaches, having been on former staffs. I've seen, I've actually seen a staff put a player who played for the old staff who was there, who had moved on to another school, watch the signals happening and then relaying to the coordinator exactly what was happening. Uh, you know, when we were at Oregon State, probably my closest friend on the staff was Lee Hall, who was a wide receivers coach. Well, we happen to leave the same year. I go to Nevada as a coordinator. He goes to Maryland as wide receivers coach. We play them in the bowl game. So we're in the bowl game, and, you know, we're hanging out all week. Our family's having dinner together. He's promising me that he's going to play it straight. We get in the game, and I, I kind of tell my guys, they form a tunnel to block the, the opposing coaches from seeing the signals. I said, listen, you look over there and make sure you see, see the black guy in the red hat. Make sure he can't see me. Well, by the second play, I look across and right down the tunnel is Lee staring at me, right? So I gestured that he was number one. Middle, yeah, middle linebacker no, I, blitz. I, I, I let him know that he was getting the middle <laughs> linebacker blitz. And uh, and then I realized we were on national television. So, you know, it was a joke, but it probably wasn't coming across as funny. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it happens with your friends. Because in the end, your allegiance is to your family and your school. And so... You know, as I learned, you know, you better change some signals around. And when, you know, we played Oregon State, literally we had the same exact signals for some things. So we changed verbiage, we changed signals, which I'm assuming is going to happen. The, the problem is right now for Oregon State, the talent gap is so large that I, I, I don't know that that's going to be a huge factor this week. But moving forward, and you see the kind of recruits that, that Gary Anderson is going to be able to pull in, I guarantee you there's going to be a lot of changes at Utah. I was going to say, even I mean, at the NFL level, I played three different teams in one year. And so those next teams I went on, we played those guys a couple times. So the coaches are saying, hey, you know, I'm not going to press you, but if you want to give up some stuff. Oh, and that's give, why give they, went to, they went to the mics and the, and the uh, help players, you know, help, you know, in their helmets because mm -hmm. they signaling. I mean, they all knew each other's stuff. I mean, you could go down the tree and there are three, four, five different staffs that had worked together and people bounced around Look so at much. the Belichick tree. I mean, oh. head coaches all over the place. Yeah. Go back to the old Bill Walsh tree when you had Mike Holmgren, you had Mariucci, you had so many guys. I mean, it was ridiculous. So, And especially, you know, some of the coaches, or Gary Anderson was at Utah a while ago, but I mean, Kalani Sataki just came from Utah, you know? Right. I mean, some right. of those key guys, so very familiar. All right, well, still ahead, they will have the keys to the game later on in the show, what the Beavers need to do to have a chance but coming up next, the Beavers not only facing a tough defense, but a tough one on offense. Allen writes in, is Utah's Devontae Booker the best running back in the Pac-12? We'll turn our attention to him. Coming up next, and well, Slade, not as good as that. you look great. Devontae Booker couldn't pull that off. We're getting ready, of course, for Beavers football coming up on Saturday afternoon at Utah. And well, the youths, they're having themselves quite a season, ranked 13th right now, but... 
Just a week ago, they were ranked number three in the nation before taking their first loss of the season at USC last weekend. So the Utes, one of the favorites in the Pac-12 South this year and very high expectations. And in our Toyota interview this week, Toyota Let's Go Places, Kalani Sataki talks about playing his former team. You know, forcing turnovers is going to be a big key, and, and if we can do that on defense, that'll help us. Um, you know, so hopefully we we're able to, you know, disguise a few things and, and get some pressure. And uh, I mean, we do a lot of similar things that, that USC does, but um, you know, we'll, we'll see how it all works out. I, I think uh, right now, going into the game, I feel comfortable with our guys knowing the scheme that we have that we've had installed so far. And, and uh, we just got to go out and execute and see what happens. Obviously, one of the biggest threats over at Utah is Devontae Booker. Mm -hmm. And how have you guys been, um, how have you been coaching the guys to prepare for him? Well, I mean, he's a great running back, and they have a great team. And, and, and um, you know, it's going to take uh, not just one guy, but it's going to take a, all 11 guys being on point and making sure that we're doing our assignments. You can't make a lot of mistakes against a, a great running back like that and, and an efficient offense that they have. So we'll be... We'll have to be on our, on our best as far as assignment goes, and then we'll have to use our technique. And then the only way to take him down is you have to tackle him by, by a pack. You can't do it one-on-one. -on -one. And Allen writes in, is Utah's Devontae Booker the best running back in the Pac-12? Well, the number's pretty good. He's right up there with the best of them. Uh, what do you guys think? Of course, um, I watched him last year destroy us, absolutely. I think he is. I mean, Royce... He's, he's amazing, too. They're both running ability right there, but I think if you put the whole complete back up there, his passing ability, or receiving ability, his ability to pass block, I think he's the best back in the Pac-12. Not so fast, my not friend. Not so fast, huh? <laughs> Statistically, he's not even in the top two. Right now, you've got Royce Freeman, Christian McCaffrey. Well, he's number three, but I mean. And, and, he's right up there. And if you talk about who's most important to their team, I'm still giving it to Christian McCaffrey. I mean, he does everything for Stanford from catching the ball, coming out of the backfield as a running back, running the ball, special teams, which Devontae really doesn't do that much of. So uh, is he a great back? No doubt. First round talent? I'd agree with that. Is he the best in the conference? No. Which should show how deep this conference is. I mean, we talked about going into the season that this was the year of the running back in this conference after the year of the quarterback last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be able to say that Devontae Booker statistically isn't even in your top two should speak to the depth at running back in your position, not even counting guys like Paul Perkins at UCLA, you know, and going on down the list, Ronald Jones at, at, at USC, Nick Wilson at Arizona. I mean, it's crazy. Well, when you're saying he's a potential first rounder and he's number three in the conference, that right? says it right, right there. I mean, that's <laughs> because the guys who are one and two, uh, one and two are both sophomores. I mean, they can't even come out right now. Yeah. And so, uh, I, well, Christian can, but I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's a pretty special era right now. We're not just offensive play, for, but for running backs in the Pac-12 right now. Glad I'm not playing against them. That would hurt. <laughs> Slade, quickly before we move on, what does the defense do? What does Oregon State do with a guy like that? How do they contain him? Tackle with a whole bunch of guys. You yeah, know, party at the rock right there. Because if you come over with one guy, it's going to look like Colorado did against Ryan Nall last week. Bouncing off legs, these big giant tree trunks coming up. Uh, you have to meet him at the line of scrimmage, hold him up, and then hold on for dear life when somebody else comes and finishes him off. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, depending upon what's going on injury-wise with some of the Beavers, I mean, they have the ability to put extra guys in the box. Uh, Utah's not going to necessarily kill you with their wide receiver play. They've got a great route runner in, you know, in Britton Covey, but, you know, they don't have these six-foot-five guys who run four threes running around outside. Or so. a quarterback that's completely consistent. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, load the box, gang tackle, um, you know, and uh, we used to call it get some. I mean, you want to make sure that, <laughs> you know, the guys who's coming in, the guys who are coming into the pile before the whistle is totally off. been blown, you finish them off to make sure he knows very early in the game that you're setting the tone. By second half, you want you want some bumps and bruises all over that body. Well, we mentioned a little bit earlier, Utah's going to be a little motivated this weekend because they were undefeated before losing at USC last week. And Travis Wilson, the quarterback, boy, as Ryan writes, he looked bad against USC. Will he be able to bounce back against the Beavers? We hope not. Had four interceptions against USC. It clearly was off his game. Had three of them to the same guy. I think he had a man crush on that guy. I mean, you would have seen him all over the field there. I'll tell you what, Cameron Smith played out of his mind. And, and here's the thing, though. When you watch the plays that happen, like that play right there, it was just double bench play. 
quick outs by two and three, fade by one. He threw that ball so late to the number three receiver. That was much more bad Travis than it was anything great that Cam Smith was doing. I compared Travis Wilson to last year Ole Miss, Bo Wallace. And they talked about you had good Bo, you had bad Bo. And as Bo went, Ole Miss went last year. Travis is the same way. As much as it's Booker and all those other things, if Travis plays well, they're really, really hard to beat. If he plays poorly, you can get him because he's the guy who touches the ball every single play. And so he is the Pac-12, 2015 Pac-12 version of Bo Wallace. If we get the Oregon Travis Wilson, who did everything right, I mean, even running, six carries for 100 yards. Oh God, I mean, he ran that, that entire – Yeah, don't talk I mean, about that. You entire don't want that game. to happen. Yeah, if, Stop, we, jinx. If, if we don't get <laughs> that, we'll be okay. We want the USC one. I mean, it's his whole entire career. He's been a bit of a bipolar player, and so you never know who you're going to get. Well, we – touched on it a little bit earlier but coming up next we will turn our attention a little more in depth into utah's defense a big tough group and uh, what the beavers offense is going to be up against that that's coming up next plus special teams on hashtag beavers football coming to you at night early getting rid of the bees on hashtag beavers football thanks for being with us john writes in youth defense playing strong the beavers offensive line might need some help they certainly are going to face a very aggressive group uh, that uh, they're going to have their hands full. Utah's defense is great, and it starts right up front. I mean, those guys are strong, and they're physical. They do a great job of, you know, holding the offensive linemen off the linebackers, and they got two linebackers with Johnny and also a guy named Norris. Yeah, who I like. Must be a baller. <laughs> uh, those two guys do a great job, you know, scraping up and making all the plays. They got a lot of interceptions. This team leads the league in interceptions with 13. Uh, they're they're a, a, a tough group. First in rushing yards, fewest rushing yards allowed. Second in takeaways, tied for third in sacks, and fourth in the fewest points given up. So um, those don't jive well with where Oregon State comes in, too. So we'll see if Ryan Nall can run through that. Uh, That's the key there. I mean, they try to stop the run, pin their ears back, and go after your quarterback. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't even want to talk about it. It's it's scary. I'm having nightmares right now thinking about it. You know, I would say this, though. The one thing that I love about watching Oregon State is they play pretty fearlessly. You know, they're a bunch of young kids who really don't know any better. Naive. And so, yeah, <laughs> they're naive to everything. And so, you know, I, I don't see them being intimidated going into the situation. And, and, you know, just go and play and don't worry about it. I think if they have the mentality of going in there and try to match the physicality that Utah has. And now, you know, they're facing, really, in my opinion, the best secondary in the country, too. I mean, when you look at how they play, they played Cal, who has probably one of the best receiving cores in the country, uh, really, with Washington State. And they literally, you would watch every play, them just line up in man all the way across the board. They were pressing the slots. They were pressing out and just saying, you know what, you're not going to be able to do anything. And it, it was impressive to watch. Uh, and that's why I think really the way that you mess with them is to try to get them on levels, try to do some things where you can do rub routes and take advantage of the fact that they just want to play man all day. I will say the Beavers have had in some stretches, some of their better stretches of the season, playing against some of the tougher teams that they had to rise the occasion to. So no we'll doubt see. about it. No this is one of them. And on special teams, you talk about games being won and lost there. Look at that. First in punting average, first in punt returns for touchdowns. They've had two of them. Second in punt return average, so uh, especially in the punting department, they are faring well. And this is how they win games, because, I mean, their offense isn't amazing. It's their defense and the field position battle, because they'll go through, they'll pin you back at the goal line and then say, go ahead and run 95 yards and see how good you do. Well, and the other thing is they don't look at special teams as a field position battle. They look at it as a way to score more points and to create takeaways. I mean, you look at what they did to Oregon in the special teams game. I mean, I haven't seen... A special team. I mean, Morgan Scali is their their special teams coordinator, and I mean, it was. I mean, we, I made a joke that it was like watching, you know, Cobra Kai Dojo. I mean, there was no mercy in what they did in their special teams game. That's a Karate Kid <laughs> reference, okay? All right. I mean, we were talking about Mr. Miyagi couldn't rub his hands, hands together and save the ducks. Yeah, it was wax on, off, up, down, the whole deal. And I mean, they they take every advantage of. I mean, their preparation was unbelievable. And that's just what they do week in and week out. And they take an aspect of the game that a lot of teams ignore and use it to kill you. And so, I mean, from Andy Phillips, who's Mr. Automatic, Britton Covey is a great returner. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, they're, they're really fun to watch in those aspects. Uh, they're fun to watch unless you're playing them or your team's playing them. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, 
<laughs> so we'll see. All right. But, you know, much respect, though. Got to respect. Yeah, much no respect. What. They do it well. My favorite Halloween costume growing up was probably uh, Robin. It was the retro Robin costume, the red with the green and the yellow. Precisely, Robin. Power Rangers. Power Rangers, which one? The pink one, probably? <laughs> <laughs> no, the real one. Morphin time! Red Ranger power! Simba. I would say my favorite Halloween costume would probably have to be um, the screen mask. <laughs> I was a cheerleader one year. It was like last minute, day before Halloween, and I went into like Party City, and that was like the only thing that fit me. So <laughs> I was like, screw it, let's be a cheerleader. Yeah, that would have been a little bit scary. Definitely. The biggest cheerleader ever seen. He's a base right there. I'm going to tell you right oh now. Oh, my goodness. Seeing Kyle Pecko in a cheerleader outfit is almost <laughs> as bad as seeing Slade Norris in tight orange pants. <laughs> Oh, come on now. Wow, come look at those now. costumes we got going on. Have you seen, like, Slade's back hair? That's actually fairly accurate. <laughs> it's just the shoulders, you know, and, you know, I, I trim it up every once in a while when I, when I can. Like the lawnmower. Oh, my goodness. Those are not good looks, let me just say. Uh, boo. Because you, you're a Halloween guy, aren't you? Uh, you have a favorite costume you're talking about? Not at all, but okay. Are you, you know, dressing up this no, year? No, because here's the thing. When I was growing up, my parents were so cheap. You know what I was every year? A football player. There we go. <laughs> every year. I was like, Dad, can I get something new? He's like, you got shoulder pads, right? No. Give me that or a Mad Max character. I'm being forced into a costume on Saturday. Yeah, what are you going to be? The girlfriend is a dance studio. We got to put on a Halloween party. Your boy has to be a sailor. I want to make that joke so bad, <laughs> but I'm not sure as the FCC may, you know, are they watching? Lucky you guys are missing out on that. All right. Well, as Slade is a sailor on Saturday, Oregon State will go for him? its first, first Pac-12 win. <laughs> Gary Anderson said after the sailor. game last week that you need four things to succeed in the league. Number one, great quarterback play. Number two, dominant running backs. Number three, a pass rush. And number four, cornerbacks. Slade, Nigel, agree, disagree? I agree with three of them. Uh, the, number two, I do not. I don't think running backs matter. I think your O-line is what matters. You could put me behind a dominant O-line, and I can get a few yards out of that. So, I mean, look at, like, DeMarco Murray with the Cowboys last year, and all of a sudden look at him this year at Philadelphia not doing anything. You know, granted, the scheme changed, yeah, but the O-line dictates how well that running game goes. I think, I think what he was really answering the question is specific to his system. So in his system, absolutely. I mean, he needs a dominant running back because there's got to be somebody who scares that defense so much that they start to forget about the quarterback. And it, it's like Oregon's system. He really, the quarterback doesn't need to run the ball that much because they're so scared of Royce Freeman. It takes one or two pulls, and you can go 70 yards because everything's focused on him. I think, obviously, when you look at great quarterback play, I don't care what system you are in this conference, if you don't have a quarterback, you can't win, which has really been the struggles of the Beavers this year. And then you go back to pass rush. When you're playing a man system, you're not blitzing a ton. You have to be able to get pressure on the quarterback. And once again, in a man system, cornerback play is, is key. And it was the same when we were, you know, with the Beavers, you know, years ago. Quarter, you know, our system didn't work if we didn't have corners. So you look at that list. How many does Oregon State have? How many does Utah have? Well, that's the problem. I mean, right now, for Oregon State, you don't have one. I would not say our running backs are no. dominant at all. You don't, so you don't have two. Have two. Pass rush, we were the worst pass rush in the conference, so we don't have three. And corners, I think you, you can have argue on corners. corners. Yeah, yeah, you have decent corners. I think Larry Scott, I think, is playing above his pay grade. Uh, you know, unfortunately, but we don't have either of those guys right now. Right, and so that's that's kind of the problem right now. And in terms of Utah, you know, you can start checking off. I mean, I wouldn't say they that, would. They don't have number one quarterback. Uh, no, I, I think you do. I think they do. Really? I mean, you, for five you put games, Travis they Wilson had great as a quarterback play a, at number. One. It doesn't mean you have to have the best in the conference. You just have to have good play for what they're asking to do. And he's had beyond solid games. They are number 11 in the conference in, in passing offense. It doesn't matter. In their system, it's irrelevant. I mean, that's like saying, you know, Navy's quarterbacks haven't been good because he doesn't throw for a bunch of yards. It doesn't matter. It's about running the offense and not making mistakes. For five, six games, Travis Wilson was exactly that. It wasn't until really the last game that he really got exposed. Okay. So, you know, and then you look at pass rush. I mean, they've always really done that there. And then quarterback play, they got the best secondary in the conference. That's why they were number – they were number – They three. are giving up – they're ninth in pass defense. You know why? Can't run the ball against them. 
So I mean, it's it was no different. They do have 13 interceptions. Well, when we when we were at when we were at Oregon State, we constantly had we were low in pass defense because people couldn't run against us. I took that same defense in Nevada. People were like, "What's wrong with the DBs?" I was like, "Nothing. We're number two in the country in run defense." So there were teams we would play who didn't even try. We would come out of games with 55. <laughs> we had two games above 55 pass attempts in a game. Yeah. I mean, it was oh like, and they're, they're sweating. Which I had, I had no defense. problem with. It's like, are you kidding me? They were averaging like five yards a complete, you know, a completion. It's like, I'll take that all day. All right. We're going to wrap it all up, put a bow on it with their keys to the game of how Oregon State can have a chance to win at number 13 Utah coming off its first loss of the season. That's when we return. All right, Utah, the site of the Beavers at the number 13 news coming up Saturday, 4 o'clock in the afternoon kickoff. Hey, you can watch it when the kids start coming. For sure. We're with you normally on Friday nights. You'll hear a lot of reactions Crazy here. I think that was here. at the Timbers game people were reacting to. All right. Well, we will get to the keys of the game because we are looking forward to Saturday. So the fans, Robert writes, a combo of immaculate play, Ute airs, and some serious luck. Either way, win or lose, I'll be watching my bees and fire. Lovey Smith writes, this may be the game that OSU is supposed to lose and win. How does it fire Lovey Smith? you have a Met symbol? Like, <laughs> he's used right there. So confused. <laughs> then we have Luis Rice, a miracle, full moon, and probably a Hail Mary. And Not a lot of faith here, so. Yeah, uh, come on, Beaver. <laughs> Not a lot of faith. Ed. A miracle, unfortunately, says Heather. All right, there has to be a way, right? I mean, it happens. All Look, at Utah got killed at USC. I mean, they went in undefeated, number three in the nation. Just saying. I slain. wish I had four hands so I get four thumbs down on all those. That was terrible. I've <laughs> been in games with no chance to win. My three things. So, number one, we got to go with the big return game. Special teams, you've got to get us on the Utah side of the ball. If you can get us over there, give our offense a chance to put some, so, some short yardage get into the end zone, we can put it in there. And once the offense gets there, our number two, don't turn it over. We cannot avoid any costly turnovers or penalties this game. Utah is too good. Their defense is too good. We can't get that, give up that yardage. Going to my third one, we've got to be able to pass the ball. Running the ball is going to be extremely difficult against this team. Seth Collins is going to struggle. We've got to do it through the air, whether it's Seth or Nick. He can get it done. Nice. I like those. Mm. All right, here we go. So my three keys of the game. <laughs> Slay. <laughs> what is the most important stat in college football? Coach, I'm here for you. Got to take the ball away. Takeaways. Got to get takeaways this week. Create short fields. Make sure you take advantage and quiet that crowd at Rice Cycle Stadium. Number two, B-gap sound in your defensive play. What that means is make sure Devontae Booker has nowhere to go. That means he has to go over you, not guys fitting wrong fitting in correctly on power plays and allowing there to be seams. B-gap sound, that will slow down the running game. Probably can't stop it, but just slow it down because Travis Wilson's probably not going to beat you throwing for 350 yards. The final thing is match their physicality. Listen, you don't know any better. Close your eyes, run up in there as hard as you can and smack somebody in the face. <laughs> work for me when I played, it'll work for you. I'm telling you, go into that game saying, listen, I mean, hey, you, you strapped up to play the game for a certain reason, be physical, Give everything you got, man. You, you never know what could happen. <laughs> and I'm, I'm telling you, all this stuff like, ah, we need a miracle. No, you don't. Do what you're capable of doing. Play what you're capable of. And, yeah, you might need a couple of bounces, balls to bounce your way, but who doesn't? But you create those things, right? Yeah, the yeah, way you're but playing, I mean, the physicality. And, and things always happen for good teams. Yeah. Oh, gotta, boy, look at We've created a monster here, oh, haven't yeah, we? That's a way to end the show. He does, not, <laughs> he does not lack for confidence. They've got to eat and drink after that picture. Yes, <laughs> and that is very scary. <laughs> Thank you for being with us on this Thursday night. We will be back here, I believe, oh, for God's sake. Friday next week, I think. All right. Oh, boy. Is that you on the good left, Good luck coach? to the Beavers on Saturday. Oh, Everyone have a great night. night.